Uh, okay, design was due yesterday, so I'll be looking at that. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about what you would do if you wanted to make your website live, if you wanted to put it up on the web. Obviously, you know, the stuff we've been doing so far, we've been creating the pages on your own computer, and you can access them on there. You send them to me, and I can access them. But how does it work when we want the world to access them? So I'm going to just define a few terms and, and talk about a few things that you need to do. And if anyone has any more questions, or anyone's interested in doing that, you can, you can let me know, and I can give you more information. First of all, let's talk about, and the reason I'm talking about this now is this sort of is a good lead into the next topic that we're going to have. So it's good to, to spend a few minutes talking about this, because that's going to lead into our, our next topic. Um, when you go to a website, when you go to access a website, you know, typically you type in an address. www.lorraineccd.edu and you get a web page. All right, so how does this web page become live? First of all, this web page lives on what is called a web server. Anytime we talk about a server, we're talking about a system, yeah. computer system, that listens to requests and responds to them. Okay? That's what a server is. There's a lot of servers, a lot of different kinds of servers. There are email servers that handles requests to send and to get email. All right, that's one kind of server. There's database servers that handles database transactions, requests for data, requests to update data, and so on. And then there's web servers that handle requests for web pages. So web pages requested, <coughs> and the web server responds by supplying a web page or supplying some sort of answer, right? Uh, the answer could be that that page doesn't exist, but that's still an answer, right? So like if I go and type in lorraineccc.edu and just type garbage after that, we get an error message. But that's still a response, right? That's still a response. All right, so anyhow, the the the... General diagram sort of looks like this. We have a client. And a client is someone, typically it's going to be someone that is surfing the web. Someone that has their phone or their computer with a web browser that is asking for web pages and getting them back. All right? That's what we mean by client. Now, there are other kinds of clients too, right? There are things called crawlers, which go and look for web pages to index to put in search engines, right? Like, for example, Google. If you were to add a new website today, within a short period of time, Google would know about it, and it would turn up in search results, all right? Well, is there someone that's going looking for websites and typing them in? No. There is, there's actually software that goes and looks for these websites. And, and they would also be clients, because they would also be looking for web pages. So anyone that's requesting a web page is a client. Clients need to be connected to the internet. And we draw because I don't want to say cloud, I want to say internet. They're connected to the internet, and we don't, we don't, for this discussion, we're not worried about how the request makes it from one place to another. We just know it gets there, all right? It's like, you know, it's like the road map. Uh, because we're not wired directly, say, to Google's web server. We're connected to an internet service provider. 
And when we make a request, that request actually goes through several computers before it makes it to the right, several servers before it makes it to Google's web server. For this discussion, we don't care about that. We just trust that it happens, and we're happy with it. And we're connected to a web server. What is a web server? It's a computer <clears throat> with software that is capable for listening and responding to requests. So the, probably the two main pieces of web server software, one of them is Microsoft's IIS, Internet Information Services, I think it stands for. And the other is Apache. All right, those are the two most popular web servers in the world. OK, I forgot we had a guest today. All right, so hold your thoughts, all right? We're at web servers right now, so hold your thoughts. We're going to have a, a short presentation. Yes. Hey do, do you want to sit here so we can record you? Sure. OK. I'm normally Not in a witness protection program or anything? OK. So you could switch the camera back and forth if you have something to show on a computer or whatever, but if you sit here. I've never done this before. All right. So this is my 90s. Or oh, they're going to hear me yeah. groaning at my bad jokes. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Matt Boyle. This is Jamie, our intern at Neo LaunchNet. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Neo LaunchNet and then also about Unity Lab. Um, so one of our events we have coming up is the Hackathon on November 18th and 20th. Um, hackathons look awesome on resumes. You don't actually have to code anything or program anything. It can have a digital component or just a physical component. So you can either come up with a, oh, thank you. If you want to come up with an application um, for helping students do their homework more efficiently or managing stress, anything like that, or if you just want to come up with a simple tutoring service, anything like that, coming up with any ideas that help student wellness is what it's all around. The 18th is our ideation day, and the 20th is our presentation day. So you're going to pitch your ideas Shark Tank style for up to $500 in um, book scholarships here. They're gift, gift cards to the bookstore. Um, so please come out and participate in that. You can compete in up to groups of five for that. Um, and then we have another event called Homecoming. We don't have a football team here, so we started our own homecoming event. Um, that actually, we invite all of our past businesses that we helped start at Neo LaunchNet. We are free and uh, unlimited business coaching and mentoring here on campus to any and all students. So we invite all of our past businesses. Some of them do have food trucks. They come out and they talk about their businesses. They sell things. They market themselves. Um, and then another one of the awesome things that I do here on campus is I'm over a group called Unity Lab. Unity Lab is essentially a paid internship for graphic and web designers. So if you would like to build your portfolio, get paid while you're learning to code things, um, we have uh, several students that are working with us on web design right now. Um, if you're interested in that, go to lorraineccc.edu, scroll all the way down to the bottom, click on career opportunities, and apply, or even just come see me. My office is in PC 113. Put in your application, and you can get you paid for getting some experience. That's the campaigner thing. So the Neo LaunchNet office is the only one on campus with a garage door. So many small businesses got started in garages, so we have our own garage. We have a pseudo concrete carpet floor. But yeah, come see us. We sometimes we have dogs and cats and baby goats in our office, so we're all pretty fun. And since it's a smaller class, I think I've got something for everybody here.
visitors, other visitors come in, they learn more on Karate. <laughs> you know, and, and you did such a good job of knowing what to say and saying it, and then you're done. So, thumbs up. I Many. Forget, I forgot one thing about the next time, so we will keep you. Okay. If you get pizza, and if it's, if you really want a crazy thing, yeah. you can there you go. Motivation. But yeah, th th thank you so much for coming in and, and, uh, and doing a good quick presentation. <laughs> PC building. Yeah, the PC building is, if you know where the, the college center is, you know where the gamers place is. So you go down that hallway, the first building you come to will be the AT building. If you continue past the AT building, it'll be the PC building. This is a great opportunity. I had a, st a student that uh, took the web development class last semester, I think, L last being spring of, uh, of uh, 2019. And they're doing some work with them. And they're really uh, gaining some good experience. One of the things that, you, that, that is important, I think, as you go in and you start considering, you know, uh, looking for a job it is something that you can put in your, on your resume to distinguish yourself from other students, right? Other students that have, uh, you know, a similar background educationally, you know, because people come out of this, this program, they've taken the same classes, had the same teachers, did the same projects. If you can show that you've gone beyond that, all right, that you've not just did what was absolutely required of you, but you've taken the initiative to get an internship, work on projects, do something on your own. Put your online port, put the portfolio that you developed for this class online. All right, uh, things such as that. That's a such a big plus uh, when it comes to uh, looking for jobs. You know. Uh, I talk to people at Highland, and they're always saying when they interview people, well, Highland and uh, uh, another place, Foundation Software, and they always say that they ask students, what have they done outside of the classroom? You know, a fan site for something that you're interested in. It doesn't have to be major, but something to show initiative and that you can go and you can do a project. So if you did one of those projects and you created your portfolio and you want to put it online, what would you do? you'd have to find a web server. Boy, that was an amazing segue, wasn't it? All right. And a web server, as we remember, is computer that has software to listen and respond to requests. You could theoretically set up your own web server. You have to be connected to the internet. You have to be running the web server software. And you could run a web server out of your house. But usually people don't want to do that because for one thing, to handle the volume of requests, if you had any volume of requests, would be difficult. For another thing, uh, keeping track of security patches to different applications and different software is, is a full-time job. And backing it up and all those sorts of things is really a pain. So a lot of times, you would hire a, uh, a web hosting company to have this. And so you might subscribe to, you might use GoDaddy or some other service, and for a certain amount of a month, you would get so much server space and possibly so much server traffic. You might be limited to uh, a certain number of bytes or gigabytes traffic going back and forth. So if you want to make your website go live, what you'd do is you'd get a web server. The way this works is, again, if we're talking about plain old HTML pages, they would live on the server. They'd be on the disk of the server. And when the request came in for them, the server would simply find the HTML page and deliver it to the client. So the, the client makes a request. The server sends a response back. And that response consists of all the stuff that we've seen in this class, HTML, CSS, images, later on we'll talk about JavaScript, and so on. So request from the client, a response from the server. So 
If you wanted to put your stuff on a web server, what would you do? Well, first of all, you'd have to have a web server, the computer with the software listing and responding. Second thing you would do is you would register a domain. All right? Every computer on the web has a number called an IP address. All right? Now, the IP addresses would be like maybe uh, the latitude and longitude of the computer, not physically, all right? So that was a very bad analogy. It's, it's, the, it's the actual name of the computer on the web, all right? But people don't memorize numbers very well, right? Uh, so, you know, Google, it's much easier to remember Google.com than whatever the long number is for Google.com. 8.8.8.8, okay, well. I picked a bad example, Ed. Any other one? Okay. Uh, or, you know, for, for any website uh, to do that. So what you do is you register a domain. And what that does is it ties a name to the IP address that you have. So people can type in www.yournamehere.com instead of typing in uh, you know, your, you know, you know, one, one, two, five, dot, six, six, eight, dot, seven, three, dot, zero, zero, one. And don't type that in, by the way, because I just made that number off the top of my head. Who knows what it actually is. All right. So, there's an organization that handles that, that makes sure that every domain you know, that, that domain names are unique, that two people, because there couldn't be two Google.coms for the web to work, right? So, you, first thing you would do is you would get a web host, you'd register a domain that would point to your web host, and then you'd publish your website. And how do you publish your website? There's a bunch of ways to do it, but most of them involve somehow taking from your computer and using software known as FTP software to upload your pages to this computer's disk. And once that happened, then your pages would be available to be requested. Now, in the case of plain old HTML pages, the server has a very easy job. All the server does is it takes your request for the page, finds it, and delivers it. All right? That's all the server does. All right? Takes the request, finds it, and delivers it. So if you had www.yournamehere.com, there'd be a default page, usually called index.html. And when someone typed that URL, it would find that index.html page that you created, just like you created in this class, and send all the files back to whoever requested it, the client. All right? Now, <clears throat> if you have any more questions about this process and what you need to do and so on, we can handle them individually. But I want to talk about more of what goes on on the web server, because there's a lot more complicated web pages than just plain old HTML pages. Most HTML pages that we've seen so far have been very um, static. What does the word static mean? Doesn't change. So, doesn't matter who requests the page. It doesn't matter when they request it. Doesn't matter what computer they request it on. A static web page is going to get is going to be the same. Static web page stays the same until someone manually goes and changes it. All right, that's what we mean by static. It's unchanging. So if you brought up your very first page that you did in this class back in August, it would look exactly the day as when you turned it in. All right, and it would look like that way forever until you went and manually changed it. But if you think about it, something funny must be going on, something unusual must be going on, because other web pages don't behave that way. 
All right, other pages don't behave that way. And if you try to think of them in terms of just plain old HTML, it's really confusing. So it's clear that something else must be going on for certain kinds of pages. For example, Google. All right, we go to Google. And we type in something and do a search. We get a page that corresponds to whatever we typed in. All right. We type something else in. we get a page that corresponds to that. Now, if we think about that for a minute, does that mean that there's a page sitting out there for every single thing we could possibly search for? No, that's ridiculous, right? How could there be? How could they know? How could, how could anyone know in advance all the things? Can you imagine the things that people search for? Some of the things I don't want to imagine that people search for, but people search for a lot of different stuff. It would be absurd to think that there was a web page out there waiting for everything that someone could search, and all the Google server had to do is find that page and deliver it to the client. So something else is going on here. And the plot thickens, because if I search for something like Italian restaurants, all right, where do you suppose, where do you suppose the best Italian restaurants are? Probably in Italy, all right? What do you think would be the second best place for Italian restaurants? I don't know. Maybe a big city like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or something like that. But if you look here, I searched for Italian restaurants. I found a restaurant in Canton. All right. I found one in Elyria, in Sheffield, in Avon. Top 10 Italian restaurants near Elyria in Lorraine County, in Lorraine, in North Ridgeville, at the Midway Mall, Serrano's, Leonici's, and so on. That's kind of suspicious, right? Because I know there's some good restaurants in the area, but it really doesn't make sense that when you search for Italian restaurants, that these are the top searches worldwide. Now, these are the top searches here, all right? So Google obviously knows a little bit about where we're at, all right, where we're located. And it customizes the search to take that into account. So if I search here, this is what I get. If I was in New York City and I searched, I'd get something else. If I was in Chicago and searched, I'd get something else. Again, <coughs> it's ridiculous to think that there are different HTML search results pages for different places in the world. So what's going on here? Any thoughts of what's going on here? Yeah. OK. That's, that's a good way to describe it. There is not plain old HTML at the other end of the server, in other words. There are what are called server-side scripts. And I made my box a little too small here, so I'll try to squeeze that in. And I'll put an SS there. Actually, I'll put server-side scripts there. And these are programs. These are not plain old HTML. These are programs in languages such as C-sharp. I know a lot of you are studying C-sharp this semester. 
all right, or have done it in the past, or will do it in the future. These could be written in Java. These could be written in PHP. They're written in programming languages that have variables and if statements and loops and all that kinds of things that you study. We haven't encountered any of that in plain old HTML because that's not what HTML is. HTML is a language to describe documents, to describe the structure and content of documents. All right? It's not a full-blown programming language that does all these things. Now, these server-side scripts typically interact with a database. All right? And the request gets a little more complicated as well. Because if I request one of these pages, oftentimes I'm supplying form data. Now, form is what we have here. It's a, a way for the user to enter data to be sent to the web server so that the web server can use it in processing the web page. So I go and type in CSS border. That data gets sent to the web server. All right, and that server-side script gets all request data, and it can use that data in formulating a response that goes back to the client. Now, a lot of things get passed as part of the request. Stuff that you enter in a form gets sent to the server. Your location sort of gets sent to the server, all right? Your IP address is sent, all right? And the IP address is used, absolutely right, to estimate what your location is. For example, our IP address would tell it that our internet service provider is somewhere in the Illyria area. So it's not precise, typically, like GPS location is. But it will know, hey, we're, we're probably in northern Ohio. OK. I'm sure it probably does say it somewhere. Right. For precise location, right. Because if I, if I were to bring this up, if, if there was something uh, both here and especially if I brought it up on a mobile device, the web page could actually get my precise location. All right. Uh, the general location, it, you don't have to tell it that. It, it can figure that out from the IP address. The precise location, uh, you have to uh, give permission for. But there's other stuff that you send too. All right. You actually send whether you're on Windows or a Mac or Linux. All right. You actually send what web browser you're on. Are you on using Chrome or Edge or Firefox or whatever? All right. Uh, you send a lot of data with that request. And the server can use that to formulate a result just for you. All right. Now, here's something to keep in mind. Here's sort of one of the, the big takeaways that I want you to have from this section is that the server's response whether you're talking about static or dynamic and dynamic web pages are these web pages that change whether you're talking about static or dynamic web pages the server responds with an HTML document it's just a question of how that HTML document got made in the case of static web pages the HTML document is already out there prepared and is sitting waiting for you to request it. In the case of a dynamic web page, uh, the finished web page isn't out there, but there's a program out there to create that finished page. And it can be in PHP, ASP.NET, any number of server-side languages. Essentially, these server-side scripts, you can think of it being like recipes, all right? 
recipes have to get processed before they produce the finished good, the product. The analogy I always give is like the difference between going and ordering uh, a sandwich from Subway and a sandwich from McDonald's, right? If you went to McDonald's during a busy time and you ordered a Big Mac, there's a bin of Big Macs back there, right? The server just grabs it and gives it to you. It's already completed. They don't make it just for you right then and there, right? But if you go to Subway, you go and you order a sandwich, they ask you for additional input, you know? Uh, what do you want on your turkey sandwich? What kind of bread do you want? Uh, what, uh, do you, what kind of cheese do you want? Do you want it toasted? What veggies do you want? And so on and so forth. Now, if you think about it, McDonald's has a very limited number of sandwiches. So they could have a bin, at least of the most popular sandwiches, waiting there during rush hour and just hand them out to people that order them. But Subway couldn't possibly do that. How could they possibly have all the combinations of all the sandwiches that you could order? Well, in this bin, we have a turkey sandwich on Italian bread with no mayo and lettuce. And this one, we have turkey sandwich on Italian bread with mayo and spinach and green pepper. You know, you couldn't possibly do that, right? So they don't try. So they don't have finished sandwiches or finished web pages out there waiting for us. They have instructions that the server executes that takes the user's input and creates the finished product. But keep in mind, when you leave McDonald's and when you leave Subway, in both cases you leave with a sandwich, right? Because that's what you eat. Well, web pages are what browsers eat, all right? That's what browsers use and display are web pages. So in both cases, whether it be for a static page or a dynamic page, what gets delivered to the client, the web browser, is an HTML page with CSS, JavaScript, and other files. OK, let's talk about what we're going to study in this class and what we're not going to study in this class. We're going to study in this class what we do on the client end to create the data and send it to the server. So we're going to study how to create forms in HTML. All right. We are not going to study how the server side uses that information to produce the results. That's too big of a topic. We'll, that's covered in other courses. CISS 232, uh, CISS 243. All right. And I think CISS 268 as well. So we're not going to study the server side coding. We're just going to do the first part of the job. We're going to go and we're going to send our data from the browser to the server and let it do its thing. So we're going to borrow someone's web server. All right? And this isn't like, <coughs> it's not like we're stealing or anything. These web servers are set up that allow us to do that. We're going to write, a, we're going to write our own Google front end. All right? By front end, I mean the HTML that allows us to do a search and calls Google server. And we're going to do that by doing a little bit of reverse engineering. All right. When we submit a form, we send it to a particular web server and a particular script. And we pass the data in the way that the server is expecting. So let's look at this. I just did a search on CSS borders. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to paste it into Notepad++. And I'm going to look at it. It's a really a long URL, right. But we can sort of pull the pieces of it that we need. First thing that we need is everything
up to the question mark. Yeah, exactly. So I won't highlight it. Everything up to the question mark. Everything up to the question mark is the name of the script that we're calling. So in our case, the name of the script we're calling is https colon slash slash www.google.com slash search. That's the name of the script. So our form has to call that script. And Google allows us to do this because they want people to use our service, because right? they want people to see their ads. So they make it easy for us to do this. So that's the name of the script that we're going to call. How we send the data, now there's a whole bunch of data that we send, but the one important part is this part right here where it says Q equals CSS border. That's our query. That's what we're Googling. That's what we're searching for. So if we can write a web page that submits to this URL and gives this data on the query string, just this part, Q equals CSS border, then we're able to use Google's search script. So this part is the script name, https colon slash slash www.google.com search. And this is the URL, or this is the data that we need to create. So I'm going to do that. All right, I'm going to create a web page. And I'm going to put the typical stuff that we've seen before. What I like to do, notice, is as I type in a tag, I like to immediately type in the ending tag. That way I'm, I don't have to remember to go back. All right, now I'm going to start out with some new tags. First one is a form tag. Think of a form tag as sort of an envelope that contains all the stuff that we're sending to the server, all the form data that we're sending to the server. You get an envelope, it could contain a lot of stuff, right? You, you know, you get uh, an envelope, it could contain several sheets of paper, someone's business card, a brochure, whatever, right? So a envelope could contain many things. Well, we could send many things to the server to be processed, all right? So in this case, we're going to create our form tag, and we have to specify two attributes on the form tag. One of them is the script that is going to process this data, sort of the recipient of the data. So this is kind of like the address who we're sending this envelope to. And that is the action attribute. And we remember from what we looked at it, that that's the name of the script. Second thing we have to do is we have to send a method. 
We can send the data on the query string, which is what we saw. We saw it as part of the URL, the data that we were searching for. And that's a method of get. And that's what we're going to use in this example. The other, exam the other option that you have is post. And that will send the data in a hidden way. It's like if you were sending a password or something. You might use post so that someone couldn't peek over the shoulder and see it on the URL. So here's our form tag. Action equals, that's who we're sending the data to. Who's going to be processing the data? How are we sending the data? We're sending it on the URL. All right. I'm going to have a text box. What's a text box? Well, pretty obvious, self-explanatory. It's a box that we can enter text into. Input type equals text is how we create a text box. OK. We have to give this text box a name. And we're going to call it Q. Now, we've seen Q before, right? Where did we see Q? When we looked at this URL, up here we saw Q equals CSS border. So in other words, Google server is expecting something in the query string. Everything after the question mark, by the way, is called the query string. It's expecting something in the query string that has a name of Q. Values on the query string, there's a name, an equal sign, and a value. So notice it says Q equals CSS border. All right. So the name of the field is Q. The value of the field is CSS border. All right. So how do we get that to have the name? By giving the name to the text box. How do we put it on the query string? By using a method of get. So when we submit this form to this script, there's going to be an item on the query string named Q, item on the query string, because we use get. The name of it is going to be Q, and it's going to contain the value of that text box, which is exactly what we want to have happen. Right? We want to pass that data to the server so that it can do the search. We need one more thing. We need a submit button. Any Star Trek fans here? Any Captain Picard fans here? All right. This is sort of the make it so button. All right. This is the button that actually goes and does this. So we can enter data into a form. That's where it sits until we actually send it to the server, till we submit it to the server, till we make it so. so this is an input, but the type instead of text is submit. And we can give it a name if we want. And we can give it a value, which is going to be the text that's going to be on the button. So I'm going to save this on the desktop. Do you have to put a name for it? You don't have to. Okay, but you should always put a value because that's what the form is. You should always put a value because that's what the button's going to say. If you don't put a value, you're just going to have a button on there, and it could be confusing to the user what that button does. No, it, it does nothing. Yeah. And we'll, we can demonstrate that in a minute. Let me put on the desktop this, and I'll save it as search.html. OK. So I'm going to open this up. Here 
Here's my page. I search for something, HTML. That sends it to Google server, and we just did a search on there using the data from our form. Notice what we have. Q equals HTML, and button submit equals make it so. All right? Because we gave the button a value, it also shows up on the query string along with its value. If we didn't give the button a name, it wouldn't show up on the query string. Sometimes it's important to know which button got clicked, right? Like even on Google's homepage, there's actually two buttons. There's I'm feeling lucky and search. So Google's server needs to know which of those two buttons got pressed. So therefore, sometimes it's important to know which button got pressed. But if we eliminated that, if we didn't have a name for it, it still work, but it wouldn't send which button got pressed to the server. So there we don't see button submit equals that. Now to the earlier question, if you eliminate the value, I lied. That might depend on the browser. Chrome shows submit. I'm not confident all browsers do that. Let's see what Edge does. Submit query. Puts it to browser default, yeah. All right, that, uh, yeah. I would, I would put a name on it so that you're not at the mercy of the browser. I swear I've seen examples where there's been nothing in there, but what do I know? This could have been 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think an older browser, yeah. But yeah, good point. Yeah, you're right. Good, good, good catch. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I said you were mistaken. I was the one mistaken. Okay. Key takeaways from this: action is the script that processes it. Method is whether it passes hidden data or on the query string. This is the name of the field that's going to be on the query string that's going to pass the value of that text box, and a submit button is what actually sends it to the server. All right, we'll continue with this next Monday. All right, see you up in lab.